Wednesday, October 27th, 1937. Storm clouds were gathering above the sea in Gold Coast, Australia. The water was warm and choppy. The light was gloomy with the sun barely breaking through the clouds. After work, a group of six friends headed to the pristine golden sands of Kira Beach. They entered the water just after 5 p.m. that evening. There were some good breakers about 90 yards out between the shore and a sand spit. Whilst the rest of the group headed in after a quick swim and splash about, Norman Gervin, Gordon Doniger, and Jack Brinkley remained in the surf. They had their bodyboards with them and they were waiting for the perfect wave to ride back in. It never came. Instead, Norman felt a sudden tug on his leg. He cried out in horror as he realized a shark was attacking him, waving his arms above his head, desperately trying to capture the attention of his friends, the shark tore through his skin. Gordon thought Norman was messing around and told him to ride the next wave in. As the next wave began to peak, Gordon noticed a sea of red surrounding his screaming friend. He dashed over to him. Gordon grabbed Norman's arm, but realizing it was barely hanging on, he repositioned himself behind Norman, trying to support him in the water whilst kicking out at the shark. He shouted to their friend Jack, who was swimming 10 yards away, and Jack rushed over. As Gordon tried desperately to pull Norman towards the shore, Jack stopped dead in the water. He began kicking and thrashing around. In a frenzy, the shark had turned on him. Jack punched and slapped the water, shouting out in fear. Panic gripped Gordon as he clung on to his friend, watching in horror as Jack was now attacked. Moments later, the shark was back for Norman. Gordon felt a sharp tug as it grabbed Norman's leg once more and began to shake him vigorously. Gordon held on as tightly as he could. His hand was slashed by the shark and in that instant, he momentarily loosened his grip. Norman somberly looked Gordon in his eye and spoke his last haunting words. I'm gone, he said goodbye. And with that, Norman slipped through Gordon's fingers and was gone. Still 70 yards from the shore, Gordon and Jack made a mad swim for it. Frantically, they raced through the water, heads down. With every muscle fiber pumping their arms and legs as fast as they could go, adrenaline was coursing through their bodies. In a moment of terror, Gordon glanced to his side and saw the shark coming right at him. Miraculously, he managed to reach out and push it away. He pushed off from it as it slipped beneath him, and he felt a surge as a wave from behind him torpedoed him to shore. But the shark wasn't finished. Missing Gordon, it glided through the surf and made a beeline for Jack. As it launched itself at Jack, he cried out, and from the beach, Gordon's brother Joe leapt into the water. He ducked and dived under the waves, each time bobbing back up to see his friends splashing, coughing, and sputtering. The rough water slapped him in the face mercilessly as he tried again and again to reach Jack. He could see the shark's fin as it circled its prey. After what seemed like an eternity, Joe finally grabbed hold of Jack. If I hadn't tried to save him, it wouldn't have got me, said Jack. Supporting him around his chest, Joe swam powerfully back towards the shore. He momentarily looked back and saw the shark emerge from the water, its razor-sharp serrated teeth only inches from his face. The rest of its body submerged as an eerie shadow just below the surface. Joe estimated it to be about eight feet long. It clamped down on Jack's left arm, twisting and pulling. Joe refused to let go. Jack groaned in agony. Blood poured from his gaping wound as the shark finally let go. He passed out from the trauma and Joe felt the heavy dead weight of his friend. His legs burned and his lungs felt as if though they were on fire as he heroically hauled his friend through the choppy surf. The beach was tantalizingly close. He could see the crowd of people now gathered on the sand, urging him to hurry as he inched ever closer to the shore. He glanced back over his shoulder. The splashing waves made it difficult to spot an approaching shark. Every second that passed, Joe anticipated the return of the shark from the murky depths. Eventually, Joe made it back to the safety of the shore. He dragged his friend onto dry land, gasping for air. The rest of the group gathered around and rapidly made a tourniquet around Jack's severed arm. The emergency services arrived shortly after and rushed Jack off to the hospital. He remained conscious throughout the entire ordeal. Miraculously, Joe had initially saved Jack's life, but tragedy struck once more. Surgeons were unable to save his arm and he died in the hospital the next day. 
it was a devastating loss of two young men. Once Joe and Jack had made it to shore, one of the group, Alf Kilburn, jumped onto a jet ski to search for Norman. He skimmed over the ocean surface and then, just beyond the breakers, he stopped in his tracks. He saw a large pool of blood-stained water and there, circling it, was a huge tiger shark. Alf returned to the beach. Tiger sharks can grow to a massive 20 feet long. There have even been sightings of 25-foot tiger sharks. They are distinctive by their dark, tiger-like stripes on their skin. They frequent coastal waters and coral reefs. For this reason, they are more likely to come in contact with people. Although tiger shark attacks on humans are rare, they are the second most common after great white sharks. The next day, some of Norman's remains washed ashore. Lifesavers and local experts headed out in a motorboat and managed to catch a large female tiger shark. She measured 11 and a half foot long, had a girth of six feet and weighed 850 pounds. When the shark was cut open, there were distinct human remains inside, including Norman's hand, which was distinguishable by a unique scar he had. There are over 20 shark attacks in Australian waters every year. Of these attacks, two to three are fatal. Today, some of Australia's coastlines are protected by shark nets and drum lines. It is easy to fear these apex predators and turn to drastic measures such as culling them in hope of protecting people. But sharks are essential to the marine environment. As apex predators, they maintain the balance within the food chain. When shark populations are threatened, coral reefs, seagrass beds, and commercial fisheries all decline. Each of these habitats is vital to a whole host of other species, not least the survival of human beings. Tiger sharks are formidable predators. Like most sharks, they have specialized adaptations to enable them to hunt proficiently. They can detect electrical signals produced by their prey and can see in murky water and low light. There is very little that tiger sharks won't eat, but their main prey consists of fish and mollusks to sea turtles, dolphins, and sea lions. But as we've seen in today's story, they sometimes eat humans. And if you ever find yourself unknowingly swimming with them, you could very easily meet your unexpected final affliction. Lambert Beach in Queensland, Australia is an area renowned for its surfing, which leads to thousands of visitors each year. Attracted by the huge swelling waves and the white sand beaches, it's hard to resist the pull of the ocean when it is presented so beautifully. With a lookout high in the clifftops, visitors can get a stunning 360-degree view of the bay and might even get a glimpse of the whales breaching in the sunset. Despite the beauty of the beaches and clarity of the water, visitors must be careful of what lurks beneath the surface of the waves. In Queensland alone, there are over 100 different species of sharks, ranging from the harmless sharp-nosed sharks, measuring only 80 centimeters, to ferocious 6-meter tiger sharks. Although Australia ranks second only to the USA for the number of shark attacks per year in 2021, tourists and locals alike still flock to the beaches every day, knowing that a shark attack is a one-in-a-million chance. Feeling safe, they will enter the water to swim or to surf. But what if you are the one in a million to be attacked? On December 28, 1961, Margaret Hobbs and her fiancé, Hans Steffens, were visiting Lambert Beach together. They had only recently gotten engaged and were excited to begin their lives together, Margaret being only 18 years old at the time and Hans being 24. Margaret was training to be a school teacher, although she was currently working in a classroom as a student as she had only recently left school herself, while Hans was a salesman. They had both taken time away from work and decided to take a holiday together to celebrate their engagement. They had a lovely day together. The sun was shining and they were basking in the 82 degree heat as they watched the sea. It was getting late, so they decided to get the sand off of them before they went home, racing each other into the water. They didn't go in very deep, only three feet deep, and started splashing each other. They were the picture of young love, ready to build a life and a family together. This bliss would soon be shattered irreparably. The couple were simply standing in the water, about 10 feet away from the shore, and chatting. 
when Hans felt a sharp pain hit his right hand. But before he could even look down to investigate the cause, he was suddenly dragged under the waves. He felt the water rush around him, and he was blinded by the pain in his arm, as well as the seawater stinging his eyes. He realized that his arm was in the jaws of a large three-meter shark, and it was trying to pull him into deeper water to take advantage of its natural habitat. The pain was intense, and for a short while, Hans tried to reassess his situation. He knew that if he didn't act soon, he would surely be killed and eaten by this animal. And so, with a burst of adrenaline, he pulled his arm from its mouth, causing him to start bleeding profusely into the water. He screamed out in pain as skin and muscle was torn from his arm, leaving him flayed and screaming in agony. Fueled by bloodlust, the shark lunged for Margaret next, and she was quickly pulled underwater next, disappearing right in front of Han's eyes. She screamed out, but any sounds were quickly muffled as the water filled her mouth, forcing her into silence. She fought back to escape, but the shark had a strong grip on her arm and continued to rip at as much of her body as it could. Hans immediately began to beat the shark in an attempt to get it off of his fiancée and shouted for help to those on the beach. He reached under the water and tried to pull her from the shark's mouth, but the animal was determined and would not release her quite so easily. Graham Jorgensen had witnessed the attack and bolted into the water to help the couple and try to save Margaret as she shrieked in pain. The two men worked together to beat the shark until it relented and let go of Margaret, where they were able to then drag her from the water. The shark remained close by, seemingly watching the people on the shore and waiting for another opportunity to strike and finish its hunt. Her ordeal with the shark was over, but she was anything but safe. She now needed to survive her injuries. She was laid out into the sand while onlookers came to check what all the noise was about, and Margaret could do nothing but lay there and look for her fiancé. She felt herself become cold as her blood seeped into the sand, and she slowly came to the realization that she would not survive this attack. Luckily for this pair, a nurse was also on the beach, enjoying her day off. When she heard the commotion further down the beach, she was called to assist, and the sight of Margaret was a lot to take in. Her right arm had been severely bitten, and her bone was protruding at an awful angle from her shoulder blade. Her left arm was completely missing and had already been eaten by the shark, leaving it impossible to retrieve. Her right thigh had been torn apart, her skin clinging to her body by a thread. She was clearly in a terrible state, but the nurse knew exactly what she needed to do to help save Margaret's life. She began tying tourniquets around the wounds, while other beachgoers phoned for an ambulance, stressing to the paramedics that they needed to hurry as it was possible that Margaret would pass away in minutes. The tourniquets worked to stabilize her, and everything tried to keep her conscious through the wait. She was no longer screaming. The adrenaline had thankfully numbed the pain of her torn body, and she tried to talk with Hans as she knew she did not have long left, needing comfort from the only person from which she could receive it. Finally, the ambulance arrived and the couple were taken to Mater Hospital in McKay, where they were separated. Both had to undergo extreme operations in an attempt to save their lives. Hans' right arm was surgically amputated as it was too damaged to use again, leaving him permanently disabled. Luckily, he did not sustain any other injuries, so despite the loss of his arm, he was incredibly lucky. Comparatively, Margaret did not have such luck. Her right leg had to be amputated also. The attack cost her her left arm and now right leg, a life-changing disfigurement. She remained in the hospital for two days while the doctors and nurses worked tirelessly to save her life. Her story had made national news and people all around the country were praying for her recovery. It was discovered that she had a very rare blood type and the hospital did not have a large amount of this type in stock. They put out an urgent alert for blood donors, and miraculously, people answered the call. They arrived in large groups to local Red Cross blood bank, but it was all futile. It was announced on December 30th that she had passed away at 6.55 that evening, and a united sense of grief flooded the nation. It was announced that she had died from toxemia and secondary shock a fate that couldn't have been changed even with all the donated blood available.
Margaret's story shook the nation, a young couple just enjoying their holiday at the beach before everything was ripped away from them in an instant. The next day, several boats set off from Lambert Beach in search of the man-eater, and a number of sharks were caught as a result. Although none fit the description of the attacker or showed any signs that they could be responsible, the residents understood that there was nothing that they could do. The witch hunt was called off, and instead, shark prevention programs were installed. Shark nets were spread across the Queensland shores to ensure that sharks keep their distance and protect the swimmers as they tried to enjoy their time at the beach without the incident being repeated. By November 1962, shark nets had been laid across several beaches in Australia, from Southport and Coolangatta in the south to Caloundra and Noosa in the north. Although her story was horrific and the ending was unthinkable, it is possible that Margaret's death saved many lives as the shark attack statistics dramatically fell following the installation of the shark nets. Although this does not decrease the pain and suffering that she would have felt in her final moments, it is a small solace that others were saved from the same fate. It is still unknown what species had attacked the couple that day in the shallow three-foot waters, although a tiger shark is thought to be the most likely culprit. Tiger sharks are known for launching unprovoked attacks on humans and multiple aggressive bites to the victim's body. They are also notorious for hunting in shallow water, although we will never know for sure what species had attacked the couple that day. Although the nets surrounding the beaches of Australia have drastically reduced the number of sharks that make it into the shallow waters, some sharks are able to get through. The nets often break after animals get tangled in the net allowing a place for sharks to enter the beaches. Despite the numerous different shark prevention systems available, none of them are 100% effective. And as long as people are willing to swim in water known for sharks, nothing can stop the occasional swimmer from meeting their terrifying final affliction. In 1920s Australia, Bulimba Reach was a popular fishing spot for locals and tourists alike. Today, it is a premier suburb of Brisbane. Its streets are lined with cafes, restaurants, and boutiques. Public jetties offering ferries to the other side of the river are dotted along the riverside, and waterfront walking tracks are busy with pedestrians and cyclists. On the morning of Sunday, November 27, 1921, Herbert Jack and his friend Thompson decided to take their young sons fishing on the Brisbane River. The four of them headed down to Gay's Corner on the Bulimba Reach section of the Brisbane River. The river flows through the city of Brisbane and out into Moreton Bay. Herbert worked on the riverside in the suburb of New Farm. He was familiar with the water and frequently fished the area. It was planned to be an enjoyable morning out, but it turned into a tragic disaster. The group carried their fishing gear from their vehicle down to the riverbank. They were going to use their dinghy, which was moored just 10 yards from the bank. But first they had to get there. Although the water was only shallow, Herbert offered to carry his eight-year-old son, George, onto his shoulders and wade across to the boat. It was morning time. The sky was overcast and gray, but there were people out and about. Boats motored out to sea from the river, and people strolled along the riverbank. That particular section of the river was an area that was known to be frequented by sharks. At the time, a whaling station was situated at the mouth of the river in Moreton Bay. Whale carcasses were processed there. The blood, juices, and waste tissues were washed into the water, enticing sharks upstream from the open ocean. Even today, bull sharks are known to give birth to their pups in the river, and there are thought to be around 500 that frequent the estuarine waters of the Brisbane River. In fact, during a flood in 2010, a bull shark was seen swimming along the streets of the city. They are dangerous, aggressive, opportunistic hunters and are one of the most likely species to attack people. They are drawn to the estuary for the promise of abundant fish and other wildlife that they prey on. As Herbert stepped into the water with his son on his shoulders, he didn't know that there was a bull shark just yards upstream from him. 
He waded into the river, heading for the little boat that bobbed up and down on the surface. It was tied by its bow to a small buoy, securing it close to the shore. When Herbert was just yards from the bank and in three feet of water, he felt a sharp tug on his right hip. He immediately looked down and saw the terrifying head of a shark. Its skin was dark gray beneath the water. Its black eye looked up at him as it rolled onto its side, tearing Herbert's skin. He cried out in alarm and tried to free himself, shaking his leg and pulling away. He gripped his son's legs with his left hand, whilst punching the shark with his right. He brought his fist down heavily on top of the enormous fish again and again. It was like punching hard sandpaper. The skin was rough and abrasive, the snout of the shark hard and unforgiving. But the punching seemed to work. The shark let go for an instant, and Herbert thought that he was free and tried to turn back to the bank. But only a second later the shark bit down again, this time biting his right buttock. With George on his shoulders, Herbert couldn't grapple with the shark very well, and he was struggling to keep his balance with the weight of his son on top of him. All he could do was continually hit the shark and hope that it let go long enough for him to make it back to the bank and dry land. In the midst of the attack, his friend, Thompson, ran into the water to help. The water was bubbling and boiling all around Herbert and George. The tail of the shark whipped up and out of the river as it thrashed around. With both men now hitting the shark, it let go for another second before raising its head up and out of the water and clamping its jaws down and around Herbert's right hand and lower arm. Herbert felt himself yanked and pulled towards the water. His face was just inches from the top of the shark's head as it pulled on his arm. The force of the animal was overpowering, and it felt as though it was going to rip Herbert's arm from his body. George began to slip and slide on his father's shoulders. Herbert couldn't hold on to him forever, and in all the commotion he was losing his grip on George. The water turned red as the shark continued to clamp its powerful jaws down around Herbert's arm, and Herbert couldn't hit the shark anymore as he was using his other arm to hold on to his son. The more he tried to pull himself backwards and away from the shark, the more it tugged at him, threatening to pull him off his feet and under the water. It persisted in the attack, and moments later, Thompson flung himself at the shark. Miraculously, it released its grip around the young father, but when it let go, Herbert stumbled slightly and, in a heart-stopping moment, George fell from his shoulders. The two men watched in shock as the eight-year-old hit the water with a loud smack. Before they could grab the youngster and pull him out of the water, the shark wheeled around and came back again. This time it grabbed onto George, and he let out a terrified yell as he was dragged underwater. The two men tried to fight the shark off, but it dived below the surface with young George in its jaws. Frantically, Thompson searched for George below the water, but there was no sign of him. He had disappeared into the depth of the river. Only the ripples from the attack remained. All was silent for a second. Then, moments later, the boy resurfaced. He was still alive, but only just. His head bobbed above the river's surface for a split second, a split second that forever haunted those who witnessed it. The shark had let go of him for a moment, and he coughed and spluttered above the water, holding his arms out to Herbert and Thompson, a desperate look in his eyes. The two men rushed over to him, but before they could reach him, the dorsal fin of the shark broke through the surface of the water. It was coming back for the boy. It hadn't finished with him yet. In the most heartbreaking moment for Herbert, he watched, helpless, as the gray head of the shark emerged once more and grabbed George. The boy was dragged under the water again. This time, he didn't resurface. The two men screamed into the water, desperate to get George back. But there was nothing they could do, and Herbert was losing blood fast. A police launch boat happened to motor past them, and they shouted at them to help. They immediately launched a search for George, scouring the length of the river, peering into the depths, and searching along the riverbank in case he had made it out. But it was no use. He had been taken by the shark, likely to the depths of the river or out towards the open sea. He was never seen again, and an extensive search for his body found nothing. Herbert had lost his son in the most horrific way imaginable, but he still had to fight for his own life. 
The shark had taken a deep bite out of his right thigh and buttock. It had severed the skin and muscle on his right hand and arm, all the way up to his elbow. As he stood in shock in the waist-high water, blood dripped into the river, turning it red all around him. The polluted water was washing the open wounds. Bacteria were entering his bloodstream, and he needed urgent medical attention. The police had called emergency services, and Herbert was rushed to Brisbane General Hospital. He was in bad shape and spent the night in critical condition. His family and friends didn't know if he was going to make it. Not only had he lost a significant amount of blood from the attack, but his body was infected from the shark bite and the polluted river water. He was at risk of sepsis and blood poisoning. The following day, the gaping wounds on his leg, buttock, and arm were sutured back up and a drain fitted for all the excess fluid. But the wounds were the least of his worries. His temperature was soaring as his body tried to stave off infection. Doctors tried to stabilize him and keep the infection from taking over. His temperature gradually came down over the following days. But just when it was starting to ease and looked like things were heading in the right direction, it soared back up again, threatening to take his life. A week after the attack, Herbert underwent another surgery to try and keep the infection at bay. He was watched and monitored closely by hospital staff and was finally discharged from hospital on February 21, 1922, three months after the attack. Despite surviving this horrific attack, he was devastated. He put all the blame on himself for not being able to protect his son that day. Not a day goes by without that tragic day replaying in his mind. The day his son, George Jack, met his terrifying final affliction.